Hello everyone. Welcome to the Open Source Summit. This is Aditya Kanekar. I'll be talking about implementing observability in microservices running on Kubernetes. About me, I'm a cloud architect at CTSA, and I'm part of the cloud practice team there. I have. Uh, uh, I'm also a certified Kubernetes application developer. I've also done certification for Azure IoT, uh, Azure IoT developer. Uh, I, in my 15 years of uh, experience, right, I have worked on different domains which includes healthcare, digital marketing, and IoT. I have done a lot of work on Kubernetes and distributed messaging platforms like Kafka and Flink. I'm an automobile enthusiast, and my favorite show is Grand 2. So that's a short introduction about me. So without any further delay, let's start with today's talk. So this is today's uh, talk's agenda. Uh, we'll look at what is observability. So we'll do a, a overview on observability, the role of observability in microservices, tools for implementing observability, libraries, distributed testing systems, and we will be specifically focusing on a new kid on the block that is open telemetry. And uh, uh, we'll have a followed by a demo uh, for uh, of using open telemetry uh, with Yager. So without any further delay, let's 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 jump in. So uh, we'll, we'll, uh, everybody knows, uh, most of you might be aware of uh, of this term observability, right? We'll uh, uh, we'll we'll just uh, touch base on uh, on some of the aspects of observability. What is observability, and then we'll move forward. So observability is the ability to measure the system's current state on the data it generates such as logs, metrics, and traces. Uh, it relies on the telemetry derived from instrumentation uh, that comes from in the endpoints and services in your computing environment. So when you host your application, right, uh, it, it, cons it, it, it consists of different components. So the components could be your hardware. Your, if you're hosting on a cloud infrastructure, it will be your cloud infrastructure. Then there will be services, different cloud services, or any other third-party services, or maybe and and your application so every every uh, uh, every component uh, generates record of each activity that happens right? so the uh, so uh, the uh, so this data is this data so this uh, this is uh, this uh, so this data uh, is uh, you know uh, is the goal of the observability is to understand what's happening across all these environments and among the technologies so you can detect and resolve issues to keep your systems efficient and reliable. Okay. So that's a high level overview of observability and uh, let, let's, let's move forward. So I'm going to use a uh, analogy here. Right? So we'll see what is the need of observability? Why do we need observability? So um, the analogy here I'm using is we all must have seen the PARS instrument cluster. The ARS instrument cluster is the monitoring dashboard for your car. It gives you all sorts of information, maybe your, your oil level uh, indication for your parking brake, your fuel in the fuel, uh, fuel level in your, in your car, speed, uh, engine RPM, etc. Right? So this helps you in understanding your car health as well as the speed you are going right when you are driving your car. Now, let's say your car's instrument looks something like this, right? Now you sit in the car and you see, and you don't have any visibility into the car, uh, in, in, in the car system, whether your car is running fine, what are the, uh, what are the uh, stats on, uh, of, your, of your engine or different components, right? You don't have any visibility, even you don't know how much fuel is left in your car. Now, if you are driving the now you start driving the car and you don't know what speed you are doing right so think about uh, so let's map it to uh, map it to your application now when so if we now if you apply this analogy to our application at any point of time we should be able to understand what's happening with your application and uh, when we have microservices entire thing becomes more complicated right you have service dependencies then you have uh, database dependencies or maybe your you know cloud service dependencies right so uh, uh, then it, then tracking the issues right if something fails right tracking tracking the issues becomes very difficult 
and you also need to know what is the health of your application right at any given point of time whether it is meeting the given SLAs, whether it is meeting the KPIs which are defined by your client right if if you don't have that visibility it becomes very cumbersome it, it becomes very difficult to maintain such application and it becomes painful for the operations team right uh, and uh, uh, we can have uh, normally we have like different environments. You have dev environment, and you might have a QA or sand, uh, a QA environment, maybe a sandbox environment or pre pro pre prod environment, or and then production environment. Right. So maintaining all these environments right becomes very difficult. And the other aspect of this is you don't know how much how much cost you are incurring. Right. Because if you don't know how much uh, uh, if you don't have the observability, right. So let's let's look at the role of observability in microservices. So microservices are dependent on database, cloud resources, and other microservices. So microservices, when you develop microservices, unlike you know, you know singleton application, singleton API which you which you develop, microservices are developed by different teams. And in a complex distributed system, it becomes very difficult to identify the source of an issue. Why so? Microservices, one microservice can depend on several different microservices. Now, I will tell you a real scenario. So, uh, in, in, uh, so we, we, we were working, so, uh, we were working on a platform. And as, as in, in that platform, we had uh, different microservices, right? We, the, so, and every microservice was, uh, uh, and my, our microservice was dependent on three or four other microservices, right? So uh, our our for the cloud uh, our for the IoT platform and we were part of the we we were the, and we are part of the data module which uh, uh, the data pipeline module which which used to uh, uh, which which was the entry point to our application. So uh, it, it's a typical IoT scenario. You ingest the data and then you then you read that data for monitoring your IoT devices. Now what used to happen is uh, we uh, uh, if something since our microservice was the uh, entry point, right? Uh, let's uh, let's say reading reading the telemetry data which was received from this uh, from, the, from the IoT devices for the dashboarding purpose, so that you can understand the health of your IoT application. The response time for that was very very short because it was a it was meant to be monitoring dashboard, and uh, response time was less than uh, response time was less than around 10 seconds uh, so that is that is also higher higher from standard but that was the max uh, which was uh, which was allowed but uh, we had a case where where uh, where our api gateway used to time out right so here you so the api gateway uh, uh, normally has a timeout of around 30 seconds right and so that means our service request used to take more than 30 seconds now, when we started debugging the issue, we we're not sure whether the issue is in our service or the dependent services. Our service was dependent on several other services to query the data. Now, in this case, we are not sure whether our service is at fault or other services. So the latency was unknown. So when we started, so then we then we started debugging the issue. It was not very evident which uh, you know API, which which API or database call. What what is taking time? We spent like hours and days to understand the issue, and then we relied on logs to find out which service was taking time. But this activity itself took too much of time because if if we you have implemented observability, it would have matter of you know um, max 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 fifteen to thirty minutes thirty minutes. To understand the issue, okay? so observability gives you the visibility in your system so that you can detect the issue, detect and identify the source of the issue. Now, this is this term is called MTTD. So there is a term called MTTD and MTTI. Okay? What is MTTD? So MTTD is the mean time or average time to detect an issue, and MTTI is mean time to identify an issue. Now this is a very time expensive operation, as I told you, right? One or two days uh, when you are in production is very is is too much, right? Um, uh, and it, it it hampers your sprint deliverables also because your team is spending time, uh, spending time debugging an issue. 
it used to is to it used to take us a lot of time and uh, at the end of it we used to understand that the dependence dependent services were taking time or there and there were cases where uh, uh, there were also used to be cases like there can be cases and most of you might have faced that there might be a configuration issue which has gone wrong and it took you did all 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 the debugging and at the end of it you found out that there was an issue with the uh, with the uh, with the configuration right so this thing happened uh, so identifying right so this is but this is a time expensive uh, uh, operation right so uh, observability helps you in reducing this mean, uh, reducing mptd and mptdi right mean time to detect and mean time to identify so this this leads to effective investigation and it minimizes obviously the downtime and other disruption to the end users the other aspect of observability is uh, in in microservices you have different applications running running uh, running uh, running as a service and then pods right the, the, uh, and uh, now when you have like 10 20 microservices how do you know what is what should be a node cluster size right? uh, this this becomes very difficult to identify right so what 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 normally I, we should do is right uh, this is the practice we follow right? we we uh, for for a single instance of your application that is the pod one pod right that is a single that is the smallest unit of execution in kubernetes a single a single instance of pod how many requests per second it can deliver under and uh, with where, when and uh, the, uh, what is the threshold where it can delivered in the right uh, and your kpis and sls are meet, right like for example i want my api response to be uh, to be under uh, under one second right and i my my application should serve uh, around 1000 requests per second and uh, uh, the memory consumption for the pod is let's say to to fb with point to cpu of 4.2 of cpu time now how do we arrive at this number right so for that we need to do a performance benchmarking for that for, for a single instance of that application then we'll know so then then we can know the threshold of the uh, threshold of uh, of your application right how much memory uh, your application use how much uh, how much cpu time it uses on how much uh, you know uh, 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 how many requests per second it can handle when when it can deliver the right re uh, expected response times so all these numbers observability can help you get all these numbers right and even a small uh, change right uh, can save you a lot of money so for example now my i want uh, my my application serves let's say 1000 requests per second with uh, 256 mb of ram and 0.2 cpu of time now that is a cpu uh, uh, now um, let's say i want my my client say we want to scale uh, the users to 10000 per per second that many requests you should, your application should be able to the application should be able to handle now it is very now since i benchmarked my application i know that my application can serve 1000 requests per second so what i can do is i can i can spin up around 10 or 12 instances right i can over provision a bit but for over provisioning also you need some number right so uh, I can spin around 10,000, 10, 000, 10 uh, if I spin around 10 replicas of my application, I can easily uh, manage 10,000 requests per second, but I can obviously over provision. And then accordingly, I can uh, size my cluster, right? So uh, uh, I hope this uh, this gives you enough insight of what is the, the role of observability in microservices. Now let's uh, uh, look at a sample microservice deployment. So this is a very simple microservice deployment. If you add service mesh and all, then then it will become more complicated. However, this is this is normally how 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 it looks like, right? So you might have an API gateway where you host your endpoint. Then uh, you will uh, then your application. Then in in your Kubernetes cluster, you will have an ingress controller, uh, which will which will talk to your API gateway, and uh, then uh, you will have services. The services will in terms will uh, will talk to your pod. Right, the pod, the pod is is, is your application, right? Uh, and you can have multiple replicas your pod. And now the service can uh, so the different services will have different database. And uh, the, here in this example, 
the service A is using cloud SQL and service B is using cloud big table, right? There can be dependency between service A and service B. Now, if you multi and now if you uh, multiply this number, right? Uh, you have more. Will have uh, you will have more and more microservices, and there can be dependencies between the microservices, right? So this is uh, this is a sample microservice deployment to give you a fair idea of how the complexity can increase, right? So this is a very simple. Uh, 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 deployment diagram, but uh, it can be more complicated than that. Let's look at the three pillars of observability. So, first pillar I'm talk, going to talk about is tracing. Tracing is basically a span that represents the execution of code. It provides you end to end flow of an execution path for a request. So, what do I mean by that? So, uh, let's say I have a, uh, I, I, let's say I have a API called, uh, a, a API called product service, and then I have a authentication service. Now authentication service is shared by all uh, different, different services to authenticate, uh, to validate or authenticate and authorize a user. Now, when I receive a request, let's say my product service has a API called add to shopping cart, right? And my API, my 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 uh, uh, my particular service product service uses a database, right? So uh, which shows this uh, item into the shopping cart. Now the first thing which uh, uh, which which uh, uh, first thing the the API would do is it will authenticate the request. So let's say now as a user somebody is adding item to a shopping cart in the, on on in the product service. Now uh, let's say while adding the shop uh, item to shopping cart, he, he gets an error, let's say 500, right? Or maybe a bad request. Now, this is happening in production. Now, everybody's clueless Why now this issue comes to comes to the operations team. They, they forward the issue. They are not able to debug the issue, so they, they forward it to the development team. Now, you're not sure why this issue is coming because there is, let's say, there is no observability, right? Now, your service is dependent on authentication service and it also depends on your database and there can be bugs in your code. Now, how do you identify the source of the issue? So this is where tracing comes in. Tracing helps you in identifying the source of your issue, right? Uh, so if, if I implemented tracing, right, I can identify for, let's say, the add to shopping cart, when I, when I call authentication service, maybe, the uh, uh, and I get an error code from authentication service that it fails. Okay? So then I can understand. Okay, the problem is in authentication service and in, in not my service. So that I can, you know, forward the request to the appropriate team. Okay? So this is uh, this is what tracing is uh, all about. Now let's look at the second pillar. The second pillar is uh, uh, is logging. Now every uh, I don't have to tell you what is logging, and uh, more, and everybody here uh, must be aware of what is logging. Right? So, but we'll still uh, touch base on this. Uh, so, logging. Why do we need logging? Right? Uh, so, let's say in production environment where you ha don't have a developer level of access, you need logging to identify the cause of the issue. Uh, so let's say um, something failed, in, uh, like, like in the last example, something failed. Now for with tracing, you can identify that something failed in the authentication service. Now, how do I know what is failed in the authentication service? Right? So authentication service might be using its own database. It might be calling some other services. There can be different dependencies like that. Now, how do I, how do I identify that? Uh, so obviously tracing can also help you there, but if you want to go into more details of what failed, the logging can help you. Obviously, the logs should be meaningful. So I normally tell. Uh, uh, so I normally have to. Uh, uh, if if I if I talk about it, right? I think the this is a responsibility. This is a shared responsibility of the developers team and the operations team. So developers team, the responsibility of the developers team is to log meaningful information and tag the information, tag the tag the log. Uh, uh, correctly, right? That is the log level, right? Should be tagged correctly, right? So this helps you. This uh, so this once you once the developer does this, right? The responsibility of the operations team is to 
only ingest the logs which are critical in nature, at least in production, right? You don't need all the logs, right? Let's say you have, let's say 10, 20 microservices, and then logs from each of the system will be will be like it will will can run into one or two GB per day, right? Depending on how much log your application generates, right? Now that's the huge cost to uh, to accommodate, right? Uh, it it can so uh, if you if if you, if if some if most of you uh, might might aware might be aware or might not be aware that the huge the cost uh, for logging is not in storage. The cost is in the engagement, right? The, the amount of data if your application generates, right? If your if your application is generating around one or two GB of uh, log per day, then uh, something like Cloud CloudWatch can charge you around 0.5 GB per engine, uh, per, per per GB, right? So that's a huge cost if you if you keep on multiplying and you will have a big bill at the end of the month, right? So. Uh, this is uh, this is a dual advantage when you there. so there is a dual advantage when you filter out the logs. One is the developers have less logs to play with. Uh, uh, obviously, you can apply filters and all, but uh, it is better to have you know meaningful information log which can help you debug the issue. You can use that budget which you save from logging somewhere else, right? So. Uh, uh, so this helps you uh, first thing is you will have less logs to play with and then it can also benefit you uh, from from uh, you know cost perspective now let's look at the third pillar so the third pillar i'm going to talk about is metrics metrics is basically a numeric representation of data measured over time uh, so some of the metrics might you uh, most of my, uh, us might be aware of like cpu consumption from last 5 minutes uh, from API perspective, how average number of requests my application received in last hour, HTTP status code received in, uh, in, in last five minutes, right? Um, so this can be, so these are some of the metrics, right? Uh, which can help you in, which can, which can uh, give you more visibility in your application by implementing observability. Now let's look at different tools which are available for implementing observability. So we have, uh, so most of these tools are open source libraries. So we have Zipkin instrumentation library, open senses, spring flute, open tracing. Now open senses and open tracing uh, are merged into one, uh, one library and that is called open telemetry. So this is the, this is the uh, latest library and most of, and it is getting a lot of, uh, and it is getting a lot of, you know, um, uh, it's a buzzword right now, and uh, most most of the open source community, whether it is open source community or cloud platforms or uh, uh, you know even the even the third party providers like Sumo Logic, uh, uh, then New Relic, uh, Dynatry, they they all support open telemetry, right? So uh, open telemetry is uh, so open telemetry. Uh, so we'll we'll talk briefly about open telemetry and we'll we will cover that in today's uh, demo also and we'll also cover the implementation part of how to you implement open telemetry for your application. Now let's look at the distributed tracing system. So what is the difference between tracing library and tracing system? Is you have you use tracing libraries to export the telemetries which is required to implement observations and distributed tracing system helps you in you know storage uh, in, in in storing these traces and metrics and then then there is a part where you can visualize and analyze the uh, analyze this traces right so some of the uh, so uh, some of the uh, open source uh, you know for tools available for this is Yager and Zipkin. Uh, from cloud platform it is azure application inside then you have aws x-ray and uh, google stack driver and uh, from third party perspective, you have Supologic, Datadog, Honeycomb, Dynatrace, New Relic, and many more, right? So these are the different distributed tracing systems uh, 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 providers. They also have, they, they are much more than that, right? Uh, Supologic and Datadog, uh, Datadog to the third party providers, they provide much more than this, but this is, but this is one part, uh, uh, this, is, this, is, uh, this is also a part of their office. Now, Let's 
look at the open uh, now the our the focus for today's discussion is uh, uh, in uh, is is open telemetry right uh, so i'll be talking a briefly about it so let's look at some of the features of open telemetry it is basically a set of apis and sdk uh, which is used for uh, for, for the, which uh, by implementing which you can implement the traces metrics and logs it uh, basically has is vendor agnostic uh, vendor uh, so it follows open standard semantic convention to ensure vendor uh, vendor agnostic data collection so that's why uh, different vendors are able to you know add the, they will to uh, whoever uh, who uh, whoever you know is uh, is complying with open standard are uh, can can use the open telemetry as uh, one of the so uh, as one of the collector right for 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 collecting the traces logs and metrics uh, it also supports auto instrumentation with option for manual instrumentation. So the uh, the auto instrumentation, right? Uh, uh, so uh, one, so there are two ways of implementing uh, open tracing. One is you implement uh, you implement using uh, using the auto instrumentation. Uh, how how does uh, so uh, how is that so? Uh, what you have to do in automation to instrumentation, and we co will cover that in the in the next slide. Is you you need to add reference to your application, and then uh, reference to open telemetry to your application, and your application will be able to send the required traces, metrics, etc. And you can also, if in the, if there are any you know cases where you want to uh, uh, manually have uh, instrument, if you want to manually uh, you know trace specific scenario, right? You can also do it through manual instrumentation. So auto instrumentation, uh, you don't need much of a code change. It might be, uh, it, it, you, you uh, in some languages, there can be code change, a little bit of code change by adding references, etc. Uh, in something like Java, it is very simple. Uh, you don't need to modify your code. You just add a Java agent. Uh, open, you download the open telemetry jar in your container and then just run it as a Java agent. That will that will uh, that will send uh, that will uh, you know collect the required the uh, required telemetry which is required for implementing observability. Uh, open telemetry also supports multiple destinations in parallel through configuration. So let's say for example I want to send data to Yager and I also want to send data to data. Right, that is also possible. Right, I can I can send data to both these destinations in parallel. Uh, and it's basically a single collector binary that can be deployed in variety of ways, including as an agent or gateway. So we'll, we'll come to this once we uh, go to the implementation part. Now let's look at the language support for open telemetry. So open telemetry supports uh, uh, .NET, Java, majority of the language, right? Which, which, which are popular languages. So Java, .NET for Ruby, uh, it also supports PHP, C++, and Rust, uh, then Erlang, Python, Go, and you also it also supports Swift. And the other part is it also supports uh, uh, in the client side application, so it supports JavaScript. So if your application is using JavaScript, uh, you can you can you can also you know implement observability by in in, in your JavaScript application as well. But if you Add open telemetry in reference to your uh, application. Now let's look at the let's look at the implementation side for uh, open telemetry. So there are two patterns which I'm going to cover here. One is the sidecar pattern, and another is the service or gateway pattern. So open telemetry. Uh, so uh, here is the example of the sidecar pattern. So what you do is in your app in in, in your application, right? You since we are talking about Kubernetes, your application uh, is running inside a container. Now this container, uh, now now in this container, right, uh, is uh, is uh, is, uh, is the, in this container you need to add the open telemetry reference. Now, if you if you talk about .NET Core or .NET Core, or if you are talking about let's say Java, you just need to download the jar attach it as a agent and and you are done. So the implementation differ for for different languages. However, the uh, the concept remains the same. So you basically add reference to the to the contain uh, to to your application, and then you export the traces. Right now, uh, since 
application, right? The, the difference between a container and pod is you can have only one image running inside a container. However, in Kubernetes pod, you can run more than one container, right? So this takes a, so here we'll take advantage of that. And this is called sidecar pattern, right? So your, your application is running, your main application is running, and then you have a side by side, uh, you have a different applications running in, in the same pod, right? So here you can see we are running, uh, we, we have hotel collector, which is, uh, which is basically collecting the traces from the application. So your application will, uh, hotel collector will host an endpoint where your application, uh, where the open telemetry library will send the traces or metrics to the open telemetry collector. So open telemetry collector, you can have, it's completely configuration driven and you can send the traces to different, different destinations. So here we are, we have shown that we are sending to, sending it to the, uh, sending it to Yaga, distributed tracing system. Now let's look at the other pack. So this is the service pattern or a gateway pattern. So what do you do in this, right? So we have service A and service B here. And if you see, there is no sidecar pattern implemented. The pod remains the same. You don't need to modify any deployment file. Instead of that, what we can do is we host the open telemetry collector as a service, which have OTLP receiver. And if you obviously it can have different receivers as well. There are different receivers available. And then it, it has a Yager exporter, which is exporting it to the, uh, which is exporting to Yager. Now, the problem with this approach is First is you need to maintain the collector service. That is one thing. So it becomes an overhead. The other part is you will not be able to get the specific pod metric because the open telemetry collector doesn't have access to your pod because you have moved it out and uh, running it as a different service, right? So specific, so when it runs, when the open telemetry collector runs in a sidecar pattern, what happens is it also collects some of the pod specific metrics, right? So this metric, are shared are are uh, uh, so uh, this metrics won't be available when you are implementing service pattern. However, when you are running right uh, in a sidecar pattern, you will need to understand that there will be a, a little bit spike in the memory usage for your application. So let's say your application is using hundred MB of memory, then you might uh, then you might need hundred MB more just to uh, so do you need to account for that. Right? But it is, but it will give you a lot more information than than the service pattern. So that's why the sidecar pattern is recommended for Kubernetes. Now, let's see the implementation part of it. Uh, so here I'm going to take example of a ASP.NET Core uh, for sub web API. So uh, in Java, it is very simple. You just need to download the jar and you know, set the Java tools option to option to set uh, to uh, run uh, to basically export the traces. Now, uh, ASP.NET Core, uh, there are there are some changes you need to do in your code. There are not a lot of changes. It is, those are very, very small changes. So uh, the way ASP.NET Core handles this is uh, you have, uh, we have, uh, you know, open telemetry library for ASP.NET Core for, uh, for, for the, so it covers, you know, uh, instrumentation, then uh, different instrumentation. Like if you want to see the traces for HTTP calls happening from your system, then uh, if there is an SQL client call which is happening from the system, you also have a console exporter, you have Agar exporter, etc., etc. So what you can do is here if you see the definition, right? This is a startup configuration startup file where you normally have your where you normally inject the dependencies in your service, right? So if you look at this. Uh, there is uh, 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 there is uh, this uh, uh, resource builder section, right? And let me just highlight it. So, so I will just highlight this part, right? So this is the part I am talking about. So you have uh, you basically add open telemetry tracing. Uh, then in, in, in that you, uh, you basically add the service. So this is the service name you should use, right? So this is where you would specify the service name, what type of instrumentation you want to do. If you want to add, so you want to have some ASP.NET Core instrumentation, you want to also have SQL client instrumentation, 
and let's say HTTP client implementation. So all that you can keep on adding to uh, to this configuration. And where do you want to see you send, send the data? So in our case, we'll be sending it to the open telemetry collector, which is running in a sidecar. So that's why we have given local host, uh, 4374. So this is the port where the uh, open source uh, telemetry collector is running. Right? And these are the references, right? You can find more open telemetry services in NuGet packages for HP.NET Core. Now let's look at the sidecar. Uh, so this is this is so from the for the sidecar pattern. This is uh, this is this is the deployment file for uh, for deployment file on the left. Uh, uh, deployment file on the left for the sidecar pattern, and then we have on the right is the open telemetry connection. Configuration. So before going into deployment uh, YAML, let's look at the open telemetry configuration. So what do we have here? We have, uh, so this is the configuration for the collector and we have three sections mainly receivers, exporters and servers, right? In receivers, you can specify different receivers. So you have OTLP receivers, which follows the open telemetry protocol. Then we have exporters. So we have, we are using the other exporter here. Then we have service. So we have pipeline. Then, then we have traces. And uh, uh, then we have traces. So let me just show this. So it's the highlighting gone wrong. So far, so forgive me for that. Let me again, you know, highlight it properly. Uh, I like uh, just a minute. So, if you look at this, right, we have uh, we'll again go through this. So, we have uh, we have exporter here, and we are using Yager for uh, Yager as X one of the exporter. Uh, then the endpoint for the exporter. So this is the endpoint for the exporter. And then we also are using data dog, right? So as I told you previously, right, you can export to multiple destinations. So here I'm exporting to Yager and data dog. And uh, for data dog, you just need a API key and that's it, right? You don't need anything else. Uh, and maybe the region if you want to uh, export it to a different region uh, other than US. Now let's look at the service uh, uh, section here. I've got, I think I have got a hang of it, uh, of highlighting part. Okay. So uh, on the service section, right, if you see, you can define different pipelines. So you have traces and metrics, right? So uh, in the traces, the trace, the receivers we have defined here as OTLP. Then we have exporter. Here we have uh, Yager and Datadog, uh, which we have defined here in the exporter section. Then we have metrics, right? You can also have, you know, processors uh, here, uh, which I have not added, but the processors, if you want to limit the memory of your pod, that is also possible if you, if you add the processor section, and then you can have a similar section here in the processor where you can limit the memory of the uh, memory of your application. So that is also configurable. So that helps you in keeping, keeping check right on on uh, on on your memory limitation site right uh, memory limit set. now let's look at the deployment dot uh, yaml site let me again you know uh, remove it so what do we have in uh, um, so what do we have in the deployment yaml so uh, as I told you, we are using a uh, we are using hotel collector as a as a sidecar collector, right? So hotel collector here is uh, is the name of the uh, I've just given name, any name you can give. I mean it's a, it's a it's a it's a container name, so you can give any name here. Then the image, and what I'm doing here is I'm mounting this configuration as a volume, right? So you will have a volume section where you mount this uh, mount this uh, particular file in the volume. And there will be a volume mount section which will mount the particular file in the in the for for open telemetry collector. So here is the mount path for for the same, and then you have a collector config. Right? So if you see in the argument, we are specifying the configuration file here. So advantage of this is 
you don't need to modify your applications anywhere you just need to uh, modify your deployment configuration file you uh, modify your application once and the deployment file once and if you want to do any changes to your configuration you can just change the come here and change the configuration here and maybe restart your application that should that should uh, that should take the latest that will take the latest configuration so let's let's move forward and now we'll be coming to the interesting part that is the thing right so we'll be seeing uh, so i have two applications before moving forward i have two applications one is the patient service and another is the allergy allergy service so patient api is uh, patient api has uh, has a method for getting the patient getting the getting patient and adding patient and uh, the allergy api has uh, is is basically used for adding allergies for that particular patient so let's let's this uh, so this is uh, this is yager we'll come to this for let's let's just first you know uh, go to the so um yeah let let me share my screen so this is the this is the yager ui uh, and uh, let 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 uh, you know go to the post so let me let me share that so i have postman where what we are, where i have get and post method now allergy service i have not exposed because i have kept it as a internal service but uh, uh, it is used only by the patient service right so what i am doing here is i am getting the list of patients so you can see the list of patients here the hip scan right so so that you know that uh, uh, this is uh, this is happening this is working in real so everything is running in my kubernetes cluster i have yager running on my kubernetes cluster as well as the application right all this are running inside inside the kubernetes cluster now let's let's look at the patient service right? so the patient service here uh, is uh, um, so this patient service uh, we uh, this is the post uh, post uh, service uh, this is this is basically where i create a patient and i also add aller allergies here right so you, if you can uh, you can add multiple allergies by separating by comma separated you know uh, uh, you can have comma separated allergies here i am not uh, uh, so this is a sample application you can have multiple allergies and this can be represented as an array but i have just kept it simple okay um, so before going there right let's let's look at uh, let me just bring up the terminal where i wanted to uh, so just give me a moment so i'm bringing up the terminal window here and my uh, my kubernetes cluster is running on my macbook air um so i will just do a get for a get pods right so these are the two applications which are running and i have the services for the same and i have also set up a ingress uh, controller so this is uh, this is what my application look like so this is similar to the sample application deployment which i have showed you previously now there is a difference between dependency between patient api service and the allergy api service here uh, so this is uh, let us let's let's now look at what what uh, look at the traces so i will what i will do is i will add one more patient so i will add uh, let's say shrink Let's one. Ranging. He has some allergies to the dairy product. Now I will just change the code to something else. 
add. Right? So you can see that I got 200 OK. And now let's do a gate station. So Mr. James Bond has been added as a patient. Now let's look at the traces for the thing. Right? So this is my Jagger, which is running on my machine. This is also working. This is also running in Kubernetes. So let me just find out the traces. So let's look at the traces for patient API. So these are these are the so let's let me look at the traces. Okay. So this is the trace which I have received. Right? You can see that my API is calling allergy API. Right? So this is the trace I have received. Right? You you can see the trace. My API is calling allergy API here. Right? And it ends with call three times. Why is that? Because it is calling for three different patients. Right? So that's why you see three different calls here. Right? So you can also see all the calls. Right? Uh, so I have made a gate API call to you for this patient ID. So you can see it here. Also on the allergy API, if I open this, right, I can also see the status code for that particular call. And I also see the open telemetry version, etc. And you can see that what is the method, etc. And and the call, right? The actual call. Now let's look at the post call. What I can also do is here, right? I can also filter by get method. So this is get, let's do it by post. And I can also see the, All right? So this is, this gives you a complete, so if something failed here, right? I would, uh, I, I would see a different status. So that helps me identify the issue. The other beauty of this is I can also see a dependency graph. So my patient API is dependent on allergy API, right? So this gives me a fair idea of my service dependencies also because I'm able to see the dependency graph. Now we'll also, uh, there is one part which I want to cover is uh, we have a Kubernetes dashboard which I have developed internally and um, so this covers the tracing part and monitoring part, uh, this thing part. And let's look at, uh, uh, this is a bonus for the people who, 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 who stayed till the end. So this is, uh, this is where I have, uh, uh, this is where we have a cube cost dashboard. So I can also, so this is, this is uh, the, so this is dashboard available from cube cost. And also it tells you uh, different pods which are running inside the system and the cost you are uh, you know uh, getting for that right so this is this one of the useful dashboard similar to this you can export different metrics and uh, uh, and you know uh, you, you can also see the ebs volumes which is being utilized you can also see the cost for the same similarly you can have a dashboard for monitoring the uh, monitoring the the kubernetes application by exporting the metric. Since we have limited number, limited time, I won't be able to cover the whole uh, dashboard with you, but this gives you a fair idea. And uh, one more dashboard I would like to cover here is the POE dashboard, which we have. So it gives you, uh, so this uh, this dashboard uses, uh, uses uh, uh, you know, QPinch to get the details for, uh, get the details if you're, Absolutely, if your Kubernetes cluster is complying with the security norms, right? So you can you so these so these are the uh, uh, so uh, this, this so these are the status right of different uh, different checks, right? So it has paid. You can see they say it has passed this check. However, some of the checks it has paid, right? So this kind of dashboards you can build uh, uh, by by implementing observability in your application, and uh, this is. So this is very useful when you are when you are setting up uh, you know uh, application for product production. Okay, so uh, that's it, folks. We are uh, I'm open for Q and A, uh, and this the the source code the the code which I've shown you is available uh, in my in, in in my GitHub repository, and uh, the observable definition I have taken from Dynatrace. Uh, they they had a very good uh, you know definition for observability so i have taken it from there and uh, so 
thank you uh, so uh, give us your feedback and thank you so much for uh, for attending this talk and uh, happy coding yeah. thank you thank you so much